airplane is down in that kind of problem in uh, the uh, Royal Canadian Military Institute. So they'll tell my mother I went down to the house on the subway and knocked out the door and um, the, the subway came to the door, opened up and did one of these and looked around and looked at oh this study in a big mustache. And uh, I told him to see the red parents there, uh see the there. I said, Oh come here, man. And um, so you know, it was just amazing. So it was great to be a bit fascinated with the subject. Um, and I've gone into World War II and Jackson a little bit, but this is like World War One has been a constant interest throughout the life. So that book uh, inspired not only my profession as a designer and illustrator, but also as a pilot. Um, so uh, I've got a lot of slides here. So I've been doing that. I do a lot of things. Like I do concept art. That's what my company does. But that's what I've been doing for three years. Um, but I also, because of the book, I thought if I really wanted to understand pilots and what, what the experience, I should learn how to fly. So I, I fly sailplanes, and uh, I was the world's worst pilot, I'll have to admit. I mean, I say I learned how when I became an instructor. Um, but I've had um, uh, quite a few hundred hours in, in sailplanes, and it's been a really a lot of fun. So I, I built all their planes as well, and doing that for a long time. So the folks seem mostly on World War I now, uh, for the 132nd scale, because they're nice and big, and um, you know, it's, Created the museum of all the pieces. But I'm also joining the Great War Flying Museum, which is on the ramp, and you can actually fly in one of these, uh, that's a World War I replica aircraft, uh, and they have a small history section. So I've been doing a lot of work with museums, and um, I belong to the Western Flying Association in Ontario Ranch, which is just a terrific one for researchers. They do archaeological digs, and they do, they have unbelievable um, lectures. So, Unfortunately, I've been working so hard on my business and raising kids and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I didn't really get into it as deeply as I have, but as I am now. And I wish I had started a lot long ago. I wish I had started a long, uh, long time ago in the whole research area. It's just so much to learn about World War One. So um, this holiday that I took was part of my research of just trying to understand what happened. So. I build aircraft as I guess some you know, so we've been focusing on World War One and there's a variety of things. I love being on kids, you know, this is beautiful the next big size, but I like doing one forty eight scale as well. Um I do usual spit fires and extra shits and all that sort of thing. And for how do you just have these there? Um I also enjoy doing uh British Commonwealth Air Training Flying Aircraft. So uh I got a whole slew of those. Um I work a lot with uh the folks at Camp Warden. We are uh, celebrating the University of Air and Surgery that's coming up. And they do want to read in the museum, so they're not involved with this there. So, um, so World War I, it's, um, it was a huge, huge, big deal. And um, I'll sort of get into my reasons of why I, I, why I did what I did. But um, part of this, I, I, I read a lot about pilots, you know, about the Red Bear and about Bishop and Barker and all those guys, and you hear about you know how they get behind the guy and part of the guns, put the guys down, all that sort of thing. And so but I really didn't have much of an idea about what happened on the ground. It was I'm pretty fuzzy about that sort of thing. So part of this is my sort of very late start of getting into the history of on the ground what that actually happened. Because to me it was just all kind of one big thing, but it really wasn't. It was it, was, it had sectors and it had major campaigns and big battles and times where there was nothing going on at all and suddenly there would be a big battle. So roughly, again, like I am just a rookie when it comes to the history of World War I on the ground, so don't take this as awful. But to me, um, what's important is that the front lines went all the way from the coast and meandered its way through France and Belgium and then ended up down on the Swiss border. And the Germans the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Germans, they all attacked on one side and they got almost as far as Paris and then they were pushed back and so the lines became stalemate uh, made over the years. Now, you probably know all that. That's probably, this is nothing new to you, I'm sure. Uh, but to me, I sort of was fuzzy again about where were the major areas? And so the major centers, I put those these blue frames around them. The top one is where I went last summer. And that's in the sector, in the east sector, which is here. YTRES, and I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it. Um, like e some people say Eepers, some people say e whatever. So that's one major sector there where a lot happened. Canadians not there. Uh, the, the area where I went to uh, two summers ago was this area, which is around 
um, uh, on the office, where there was a big offensive um, and true for, again, for a long time. So, and then the other area, which I don't want you to to go to, is the Bear Mountain area with the Frankfurt. So the French were largely sort of watched kind of all here, Americans, Australians, Canadians, and British went, you know, meandered up, up, the, uh, up to the coast. So I'm exploring these major areas first and just, you know, seeing what, you know, what it looks like. So the first tour that I took was last, uh, two years ago, and um, I took it from a, uh, I've always been interested in a great tool, and how we got shot down, and who shot him down, and all that sort of thing. So effectively, it was, um, you don't know the history of all the ritual, but it's, uh, there's a lot to it. Um, but he was, he got away 80 victories, and he was in that sector, which is around Amiens. So I thought um, it needs to tour the ground, see what was in the area of the Somme, but then, but also to fly there, and see what it looked like on the air because it's a very different perspective from the air, from the ground. So, um, so that's what we did. So there he is, the Red Baron, shot down the eight-year cop. Um, and there's all sorts of controversy about whether he was good, whether he was just shot down two seaters, all, all sorts of stuff. But um, there was an active fight at the end of his very last flight, where he was in a dog fight, and he rolls down to, take, to knock out this 80 for still he, he ended up chasing the aircraft. Um, Canadian, uh, his name was May, chasing down that low level, the Amazon River, and um, uh, another Canadian, uh, Roy Brown, came by, took a pass, fired a pass at him, and, and it was, he, he was the one who had been confirmed to have shot down Red Aaron. So Red Aaron turned out, kept chasing him a little further, and went past Australian positions, because he was very low at this point, flying up the, up the river. And then he was hit. So the controversy is, was it Roy Brown Canadian or was it an Australian guy on the ground? Um, to me, I'm just like, you're not going to find it, uh, the, the, the exact answer tonight. I think it was the Australians that got him. It just, there's all sorts of, I don't know, sorts of neat uh, studies about what actually happened. You can see them on YouTube, um, where they've actually fired a group in a little bit. And, and they located the positions of the guys on the ground. So there's been a lot of uh, research. So why is he interesting is the, is the question. Um, and to me it was, it's like a hero, he's my hero. There's uh, Steve Lee, there's Harvey Lowe. There's, <laughs> like it was cool, I got into it, right? And you're into like Red Aaron and God Fights and all that sort of thing. But the more you study into World War I, you realize it really was one bit effing mess. It was just an awful um, kill of, of of, of uh, so many people, it was, it was, a, it was a real tragedy. So, um, um, you kind of pull back, or I pull a little back uh, a lot, I guess, from the, the hero of, of, of the book, and you get, you get into history, and um, it's amazing what's happening today, happened then, you know, you know, so like right into combatants and pencils and races, right into the combatants. So, the, the same, so many scenarios that are happening today that happened in World War One. So, um, Anyway, so I decided to um, go back and see it from the air. And my experience as a, as a glider pilot um, is kind of unique as a pilot because you're flying a single seater aircraft, and you know, we, we do a certain round of thermals to try to get up, and that's how we get up and stay up and go cross country. And it's the closest you can get to a dogfight without being in a real dogfight. So, it's, I've been in gangs like this with 12, 15, 14 aircraft, and there's certain round of degrees, and everybody's trying to go higher and find that lift. And you're really not looking at the ground. You're, you, you really aren't paying attention. You're looking for guys up here and down there, and you're, we're trying to get close. You know, you have to find that rising air. So um, it's really exciting. You, you come out of your sway, and it's exciting as hell, but um, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. So it's kind of like what a dogfight is like, except no one's trying to kill you, but you're trying to stay alive in these things. So, but you do get very close to other aircraft, and um, every nuance you look at here, you can see from, from the guy who's, who's in front of you. So um, it, it is a, it's a lot of fun.
but it's dangerous, can be dangerous. Um, but I thought from that perspective, at least I get a little better idea of what it's like for a fighter pilot when he's up in the air, and uh, there's a heck of a lot more going on. So when you're up there, this I'm not sure how high this order I've seen. I didn't take this picture, it was long, long, long. But that's the song battle. And you can look at all the maps you want, and you can look at, you know, you can pinpoint whatever, and then you can roughly where they were. But your environment is three-dimensional. You've got more above you than you have below you. And you don't um, you have to be looking around. And I've been peacefine in peacetime, and I always rub necking around. Uh, by the way, interesting phenomenon. When you're in a thermal, I've heard about this in dog fights. You're starting to have all these guys, and you're looking at them, and you're out, you know, climbing them all, uh, uh, climbing up the thermal. And then when you bug out of the out of the thermal uh, and look back, everybody's gone. This guy's empty. I've heard that about dog fights before. It's really weird. Where is everybody? Um, so things happen fast and change quickly, and it's good to be aware of that. About what happened in Von Richthofen's final flight, the uh, final fight, because it's not just about um, the facts and about measuring where things are. You have to be aware of what the pilot was, was experiencing. So from up here, um, you can be, you, um, you don't know where you are over the ground exactly, because it's the higher you go, you just can't tell. One time I was flying in Colorado, and we were up at, I was getting checked out, and we're up at about um, 15,000 feet. And the fella um, asked me, okay, where are you? And I looked at him and said, oh, I'm here by that barn over there, by that cross section. He said, oh, God, I can look your instructor. He slid this upside down. He said, well, we are right up on that barn. So um, the higher you get, the harder it is to see where you are. So just keep that in mind. So um, that's where we are. <laughs> the Somme River is here. And this is the town of Amiens, A-M-I-E-N-S. Um, so we're, we're close to the coast. And um, the river is, the Somme is, you know, this was the battleground. The rivers are coming from this way, the alleys are coming this way. The Somme is really a marsh. It's, it's kind of a, a meandering path. And, the, and the, you know, you couldn't really occupy the area in between. It's so swampy. So and what you also don't see is between each of these uh, rivers, there's like a rise, like and there's a ridge. So that tells you that you can come from the ground to a whole different, a whole different experience. Um, there was the Australians were in here, Canadians, or sorry, the Australians were in here, Canadians were, uh, were also in the center as well. So Roy Brown took off from the airfield up north, up this way. So um, again, this is another map I'll just to show you the, the, the front lines. There's the town of Amiens where you can go today. Um, this is the Somme River, and there's all sorts of famous places, you know, even from World War II, you know, um, the, the village of Bocage is up here where Whitman was knocked out in this tiger, and just in that, very close to this. So those front lines really moved around quite a lot, but they were stalemated along this green line for quite for the, the time of the um, in, in 1918 that I was studying. So, sorry, I talked a long time. There's more and more, more detailed maps that you, I won't get into these, but um, they were really industrious and uh, map makers during World War I. That's why the reconnaissance aircraft come over. The, the, front, the, the trenches were changing continually. You have to photograph them um, and then mark them on map because and things have happened you know, relatively quickly. They, they can actually put the artillery part down with where they wanted, but they needed precise information. So, Hence, the two seaters were hugely important. And so, you want to shoot down the two seaters. That's what the fighters were meant to do. Not really meant to fight fighters, the fighters were meant to get the two seaters, because those are the ones that really were doing the run for World War I. So, um, Canadian Corps here, the Australian Corps here, and here's the song here. And this is getting closer. And you can see where the river, the song, you can see some in photographs, it's very marshy and it's not really a strong area. And there's also a canal that goes through here. So the front lines are here. So but there's nobody really occupying this area here. There, you can see where the, the higher points of the um, of land are. So the, the actual combat, the chase on Rick when he was chasing May, he went down the 
the psalm, which is the low point. And then this bridge here, called Merlin Court Bridge, actually starts to rise quite a bit. So he was going up the river, and the ground was rising. As he, and then the machine guns of the Australians were all along here. So um, this is a, a Google. <coughs> Um, a, a Google, Google view of it. Lots to see in here. If you're into, into like the studying modern hands and the, all sorts of really interesting stuff to see in through here. Um, but I kept having to sort of refer to Google Maps and the World War One maps and just to really get on top of each other, really figure out what was going on and where and who was where. So. Um, this is basically what happened. The ground came from up north here, from um, Bert Angles. Um, he came down, got into combat here around this town called Sally II. And that's about a 20 minute flight. And then a uh, Tom Richfolden took off from here and then flew along the, the, the song up the, the valley. And they had a, there's a lot of things that happened that day, but it was a big dog fight. And they got um, the, the um, on the roof open, this squadron got engaged in this dogfight with the British Australians and all those good things. And it happened right over here, right over the front lines. So usually the wind blows from left to right. That's the prevailing wind. That day, the prevailing winds were coming from that way, which is important. So you can go in a wide open position. And usually the Germans stayed on their side of the lines. They very rarely went over to the British side of the lines. The, the British um, um, and the French, most of the British were very aggressive. So they would go over the German line all the time. So most of the kills that they got would be over the German lines. And the German lines and the Germans would tended to stay there. So it was, um, anyway, that's another thing to keep in mind. So because the winds were blowing out this way, they, I, they may have forgotten, it was a really strong wind, but still, you, you're carried over into British territory. And that's an important aspect. So, Sally Lissac is where um, the big the main part of the dogfight was. So, essentially, what I want to do is fly that group of the glory wind. So, here's the ridge, the Merlin Court Ridge, it's called. You can see the river takes a bend and through here. And over here is a town on the Alps. So, on the river, what we keep from here, um, um, Roy Brown and, and the British uh, they got engaged in this combat here, and then they chased. The rich will chase. Um, yellow is May, and the Katie, right down the valley. And you can see what happened is that the ground is rising, so they went lower and lower and lower. And then they came to the ridge, and they had to go off over the ridge. So the Australians were, were gunners were located uh, along this ridge, and they fired at him as he went by. So you can see that Roy Brown, this is rough, like this is still like 100 years later. Who knows how precise this is? But, it seems like Roy Brown got entangled in the, the dogfight, saw that Von Richthofen was chasing May, he dove at him, fired at him, and then went away. But Von Richthofen kept continuing the chase as he went around here, and went up and over the ridge and crashed there. So, uh, there's all sorts of maps and diagrams about who was where, and it was done by the gunners, Hopkins, and Buey, and all these guys. And they got some pretty, you know, pretty precise measurements of what happened. So that's what the song is. We're going back uh, just before the war. Uh, we're looking at Marleycourt Ridge, what they call Vinny Ridge and um, Passchendaele Ridge. I think these are like big mountains, so they're not. They're like there's little rises really of a few hundred feet. But still, because the most of it was quite open, they had fire from the top and they were able to fire down. So. That's the ridge. You see it's quite low there, and it's getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. So they were actually flying right along this way, from right to left, in, um, in that famous chase. And all the, the neat thing about this is that all this exists. This is where um, we're on the court ridge. The river takes a bend, and that's the brickwork. That's actually where they crashed. So they came from right to left, chasing each other, and flew up and over this ridge. And crash, and that was the racing group that we did, and it was pretty cool. Um, this is an Australian position from the ridge looking down in the valley, so the Palm River will be to the right. You can see they're elevated. 
not soundly a sec if you were to look over to the left. Uh, and again, it told the bird bombed the robbers during the war. Uh, and it used a shot from much further down Merlin Port Reach. The combat, the, the crash happened like over there. But you can see it, it's quite high here. And uh, I found that out kind of almost the hard way from my over flying. So I, I, I really studied the heck out of the, out of the terrain to see you know, what was where. And um, uh, I won't get into the, into the details of all this, but a lot of this stuff is available on Google Earth. You can go to maps, and also see across from everything seems. And it's kind of fun, doing that research is kind of fun. But you'll see that, um, that the features that are existing today existed back then, uh, are still there. Um, there's the canal. This photograph will actually manage to locate this exactly in Google Earth. This is where this those guys are. And you can see the canal on the right hand side. There's the canal. Um, you look at the features, and I figured that this is that's where this, these guys are sitting right here. So I brought them back to the slope and Sally was like, So they're pretty, they would have seen the Red Mary and she's coming right down from down there, coming this way across the Car, yeah. how high were they flying off the ground there? They were, I'll actually show you, they were so close they almost hit a church wow. that was down in, in the in the back of the, um, uh, in one of the towns. Mm -hmm. So they got right down to tree top level. So Horizon, they were where the, like, that red line hits the really mm -hmm. were very, very low. And mm -hmm. the great folk was concentrating on getting behind the road. was just soaring like crazy. And um, he was a junior pilot. And Von Richthofen was so determined, he was coming down, and he kept on so very good this all the time. And you just, you, you lose the fact that you drifted over, over, over British territory. You, you, so he, I think he wasn't really aware of where he was. He was focusing on, on, on getting uh, May. And meanwhile, also, as he was going along, the ground was rising to his, on the right hand side. So, Here's, again, the, the view from before. Here's what it looks like in blue blur, and now it's all it's pretty hard to imagine what it looks like. It's pretty blush and green. So I wanted to fly that route. So we took off, we rented an airplane here. We got a pilot, a local French pilot, and uh, from this airfield, which was a World War II base. In fact, they had like a uh, battle regiment that would use the space. So here's the town of Amiens, which was never really taken by the Germans, I don't believe. So uh, it was longer rubble. But it's there, it's still living. So we took off from this airport here, and we flew, it took about 20 minutes to fly here, and then we kept going to um, where we uh, took off, and then we basically turned back and came right down low level along the river. And um, so that's the, 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 uh, the airfield. This is kind of this little uh, place like gliders, and there was kind of cool. And, um, um, we were in the little airplane called a Robin. And I asked the one guy, I didn't want to see from strange at all the back now. And I asked the guy who was running in the club, um, do you mind if we go sunk metro meters? And he said, no, 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 Monsieur, no, no, no. I looked at it, no problem. So I the pilot, this guy here, looked at me and kind of winked. He said, don't worry. So um, he's an aerobatic pilot, so you know, pretty safe. Um, by the way, on, on YouTube there is a documentary where they actually, it's like who killed Red Baron, and the very airplane that we were flying is in that documentary. So it's kind of cool. So the problem is like, a, it's like a type of chair, and it's got these um, turned wings. So, anyway, so we took, we um, took off from there, and in my hand there, I got a, uh, a little piece of Red Baron's airplane. Um, a fellow named Larry, Larry Watson, who's in London. He said, oh, he got a piece of like this, a piece of dangling off. He said, oh, you're a great guy here, take this, and he gave it to me. So I had this little um, fingernail size piece of red barren airplane, and just because I'm stupid, I decided to take it with me and uh, reunite it to uh, where it came from. So my wife was in the back seat. She's as cool as you could ever. She's flown with me before, Tosky, uh, believe it or not. And she, and she was pretty, she, she thought it was pretty cool. Um, so here we are. So um, I took a whole bunch of, I was like hanging out pictures and you came lower and lower and lower as you went. So, you know, I was, again, wherever I took a picture, I was looking for one that looked like World War One. 
So you can see much more lush, but it's pretty, pretty bleak back then. But it's still a very swampy place. And then most of those flat, like we're looking from where we come. We have to do it that way, or sorry, not this way. So we're, uh, um, sorry, got a little muddled here. Um, anyways, it's, it pretty well looked like that world world, very swampy. And as you're going along, when you're flying the valley, the, the land was rising more and more and more as, um, as we went. So the past whole time of is actually still there. And these are just shots of just flying up that valley. And uh, it's really hard to imagine this being a battlefield. But this is ground zero. This is where it all happened. And well, you can see we got lower and lower. And, um, and, and at one point, I was taking pictures, and I looked up, and there was more than a bridge like, in front of us. So um, he and he was walking over there, just going to three degrees of the bottom. We climbed up and over the ridge, and we turned to the right, just at what Ron Griffith had done. So we, 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 we passed the trees at about, I don't know, 100 feet or so, 50 feet. Um, we got very close, very close, so it was pretty cool. Um, and you see our title around there. So we turned right. And this was again, like he had just passed the, the gunner, um, um, Hopkins, down here, and then passed more gunners over here. And he came around and crashed right there in that field, right there. And that, this is an important feature. This is a little more than one. It's called earthworks. It's a chimney. So if you, if you look into it, the earthworks keep figuring in. So we're, getting, we're pretty low here. And there's the earthworks. So we're coming around, and we're turning around, and that's the crash site. And you can actually drive and stop here, a little sign here that you can see what um, what happened. So there's some brickworks. You can see it's not exactly an air cannon flight, but it's not great. Um, these are all, you don't see them, there's nothing there anymore, but still, it's like back to the right there, and it exactly got shot down. So once we got back, we went on a little driving tour. And this is where uh, there's the brickworks from the ground. And uh, that's what you see at the site. So it was pretty neat. I had experience to actually see the you know, piece of history was, was made right here. That's the church they almost they clipped that tower. There was that wall. That's his last. That place is still in the chateau where he was living on the day he took off and died. So that's still there. It was up for sale. It was pretty cool. This now this this thing they can fuse all the old clip that tower. So. And then after, after the, that little experience, we sort of went on a driving tour. We went to Vinny Ridge. Have you guys been to Vinny Ridge? Yeah. yeah. Pretty like cool. So, so, like, very cool. Yeah. Like, if, if you're Canadian, you kind of like, oh, yeah. it should be on your list, right? That's where to go. Because a lot of Canadians are built here. It's on our $20 bill. <laughs> it's, it's on our $20 bill. If you check okay. it out. All right. <laughs> Uh, Fabulous Museum there, which is um, you know, a place called Deadville. And honestly, I don't know a lot about World War One on the ground, but it was just you know, it's fun just to get in. These museums are terrific. You know, they have a little area which is glass, and they have in, under the glass the things that they take out of the ground, which is you know, hard wire. Yeah. So they're really reverent of the history over there. More than we are over here. Um, so that's sort of a, a summation of, of that first trip. So it was really, really cool. So, um, so last year we went to um, to eat, and uh, that was it's, it's another place where you know I hate to say it, but if you're Canadian, like it, it should be on your bucket list of where to go because it's almost like a, a holy shrine in a way. There were a lot of Canadians that still there, um, and we kind of tend to forget our history. So eat is um, where we headed. We actually went to a, a business conference in Indiana, and we took another flight to Brussels, rented a car, and went over to, uh, to eat. Now, this building here is called the Top Hall, and it goes back to, I don't know, 1400s or earlier, and it was bombs of nothing. And they rebuilt it, which is, you wouldn't know, you were the town of Eve, and it's a beautiful little town, um, but you wouldn't know it was pulverized. So here's the town, and, and it's, the front lines came along, and it created this, what's called in round terminology, is it's sailing. So basically, it falls in the lines. So the Germans were attacking from right to left, and they actually attacked quite close to the neighborhood of the town, and so this bubbles is the important thing. 
And but it was a healing route here. So because the Jupiter can build a fire from here into the selling it. So no matter what direction, they can always they're always firing into it. Passchendaele Ridge that you hear about, that's here. Hill 60, where they blew the big craters and all that, that's up here. The first gas attack that ever happened in the world happened right here. So the, 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 the Canadians were holding up well, this area, and then the, um, the French colonial troops were here, and then they, the gas attack happened, and this created this huge bulge in the line, so the Germans were swarming in through here. And so the Canadians had to come in and fill that, fill that gap. It's, it's a really nasty bit of history, is, is what happened to these, these poor fellows that were in here. They were from colonial Africa. And they had like they didn't have a clue. No, there were no gaps, masks, there was nothing. And then some of the Germans launched this pack, and these poor guys were slaughtered up in here. So the French actually, the French and Belgians lines were in here. So this was a real mess in through here. So but the whole trip started in Newfoundland. It was the idea of like of going there. We went previous to this to Newfoundland, a lot of in the summer. And um, it was just great. We've been in Finland, you know, it's a beautiful place. So, we of course are interested in the history and all sorts of cool stuff. This is this says Altheus uh, Dowding, who died in a blizzard at the ice field April 1st, 1914, age 22. So, I really got to appreciate, I've never been to Newfoundland before, it's almost like another country. And the history of there was amazing. What people went to, like, you think that this is where they were. And they went over and, and fought, and a lot of them died over in over in um, in Belgium. So they have little memorials like this were here, and their names and scribed, and and but some of the the new planters who went over. So I thought, you know, it'd be really cool to like here's one that says Eve. So Stephen Morris here, and they tell you about the people there. The more Morris, they tell you like he was still at Eve. So I thought it'd be cool if I picked up some rocks from the ground here and put them over there and put them on their graves. I'm kind of weird like that, but um, I thought it would be kind of neat to sort of connect it. I like making connections, you know, like that model, who flew that airplane, like where, where did it fly? And I love these connections. It's kind of like getting me going. So keep that in mind. So when you get to eat, just so you see it beautiful. I mean, you walk around, and, um, but this was nothing. This was like, well, so, uh, our hotel was actually around the corner there. What's important is down this street is a gate called the Manning Gate. And I'll just tell you about that a little bit later. So that road takes it down the Manning. So you can look east that way. But this was, there was nothing here. This has all been rebuilt in World War I. It's just an amazing job. And that's the street that we're on. And it's kind of cool. We got to the hotel and there's plant materials to the lobby. So they're very, very reverent about World history, and they really respect Canadians who fought, fought here. So this is E right here. So that very that beautiful uh, building that I showed you, Plot Hall, that's it there, and that's what or that is, that's it there. Um, my hotel is this pile of rubble right here. <laughs> so that's on the street. Like it was literally nothing there. Would, would that have been artillery? Uh, yeah, yeah, continuous, yeah. continuous. From Martin, it was non-stop. That's the main plaza. The, the shot that I showed you, I said the main gate is that way. That's the main plaza right there. It's all rebuilt, rebuilt. We had no clue that this is what it looked like back in World War One. Can I ask you, uh, Garfield, what would it be the strategic value of bombing civilian cities like that? Uh, uh, the bombing civilian cities? Um, war. The, Just a trick. Yeah, it's war. The same with it today. I mean, the. Um, you know, the, the towns are generally hubs where a lot of roads of meeting in. And you have to think that they're like fields that are, um, so the roads are important. Really gotta, and so the towns were generally where there are concentrations of, you know, of people, munitions, supplies, and all sort of things. So just bombing the crap out of it was just what they did. And, uh, I guess that's what they do in Ukraine. It's, it's, what, they're, and it's what they're doing right now. It's the same thing. It's right. Um, yeah, so. Um, there's a canal there as well. So again, there's the cloth hall on the right hand side. There's a church. So the main plaza is kind of over there, and then the gate is over that way. But there's a canal on the left. It was just 
you really have to use your imagination. Otherwise, you can go and find a, a picture and try to match it up with the, with the wartime view. So um, this is Simon. Um, he's a tour guy. He's actually the, uh, he's, he's an Irish guy. He's a big cop. And uh, he gives tours. So for 100 euros, he took my wife and I all around for a whole day. He gave us lunch. A little bit. It was amazing. He kind of knows He works with the 48 Heimlanders. Um, um, and he built a memorial for them. Anyways, the guy just knows so much. It's amazing because he's incredible to us. I know him through the Western Front Association. Um, this is a map that, uh, you know, again, the, the, the Newfoundland connection, the Newfoundland troops kind of went from here to here and they ended up there. Um, and each, there's these big, huge elk, um, caribou statues at each of these positions to show you the main areas that the, that the Newfoundlanders um, fought at. And that's one of them. So this whole five system, the one of the new plants, you can start your journey in. That's just one little thing that I thought it'd be cool to kind of explore. Do they have one in Gallipolis? Do they? Yeah, if they, they fought. If, if, if they don't have these spies. Yeah. So, yeah. have you seen one actually in Gallipolis? No, my, my, my Aussie buddies go up in there and they know that the new plant is fought there. Okay, good question. It's a good question, yeah. Um, so Simon took us to this, um, and it's all sorts of graveyards, you know, they basically very, very close to where they were. This is a German bunker that's from a little that still exists. And um, this is one of the first graveyards I went to. And each headstone will have, like, a traditional press or, um, you know, they might have a heart from Ireland or three feathers from, from Wales or the caribou from, from Newfoundland. And you can kind of walk up and down and see the different people who were you know, you see me, but a lot of these things will just say unknown, you know. Um, they just find them all and it looks like a person good enough. So, uh, this is Bill Ricketts. Again, my next stage is to sort of look into this, this fellow Ricketts. This is one of the stones that rocked the Newfoundland right there. And it's on top of it. And um, this is kind of neat. You know, there's a whole bunch of Newfoundland. They think they're young, like 22 years old. Are there any 22 year olds here? Um, like they were really, really young. Um, you know, there's also thing, you know, there's a Jewish uh, flyer here at Royal, um, Royal Flying Corps there, age 22. So it's kind of neat, you just see these. Um, but you can just take your toes to do so much of this stuff. <laughs> this was on one of the graves. This fellow here, so I guess a family member at Town's Grave put his picture on the grave. Um, so it's a thin case column, Royal Air Force, shot down through October 1918, which kind of sucks because the war ended. Later. So anyways, lots of little histories you can go into, it just it's endless, absolutely endless. And this is a bunker that the Germans have built, still there. Um, and then we went, at one point, um, some of the we went to see that Australia Memorial. They said, well, there's, I know there's a VC that was running around here somewhere. So we said, let's go and find it. They said, well, it's kind of going around here, if I'm not, we're long. And so we basically hijacked this and took us to where the youth land is going there be very possible for one. So um, it's there, there's the town, we're a ways away. Um, it's all named um, Ricketts. So he won the very cross meeting, youth lander, right here. This is the very spot where he won the very cross. That was all this rubble. It was probably like bombed out to the top part. It was machinists in here, there machinists, and he went and uh, rescued these guys and took machines to the nest. And there's a little memorial. It's kind of cool. See, you can flag and you look at the little pop and roll, you can flag. There's a little memorial there to the Ricketts. And it's funny because when I was in the museum in Newfoundland, in um, St. John's, uh, the place called the, the Rooms, and I was just was chatting with this guy. He said, What? And he told me that he was the next door neighbor of Ricketts a long time ago. So I thought, oh, that's like cool. I never heard of this guy. So we'll get into it and then anyway, so um, this is my silly little things. Then we went on to around you know the salient and we went to Cashdale Ridge. So that is was one big bloody, muddy, horrible mess. But it's beautiful. It's kind of neat. You feel proud of the you come there and they sit in the room just in there, so we're taking care of it. Um, this is where he popped open the, the back of the car and brought out the bag and follow the line with your lunch. So um, you're at the very top of the ridge here, but you, you just cannot tell that there was a battle here. That's actually one of the like, the world war one. Like that 
speech that I took was on Hopper Ridge in this way. So that's actually our bridge. That's an important land. And it was even old ground and it's swampy as hell. So like, this is what you had to go through in order to take that. So it's almost, un 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 you just can't imagine you know, what it looks like. This picture is in the work in Ottawa. There's a big curved room with this poor guy with these gone. So you can stand in there and you can look around this. It's great. Great museum. Um, this is uh, yeah, Hackendale Ridge. So um, it can be. I'm not going to blow through all this because it's boring. But you know, if you want to study, there's all sorts of modern maps. There's, there's maps that exist from World from World War One. about showing how the artillery fire went and did a premium garage. So it's kind of neat cross reference along this stuff. But you can see the Canadians were, this is actually water. They had to like go through water, get around it, in order to get up on that bridge there. Um, this is a map um, of the creeping barrage. This is how scientific it was. I had, we had a talk about this a couple weeks ago in, in APAC with the Western Front Association. So this is basically the bridge lines, and these lines represent artillery fire. So you, as an artillery, Gunner would be aiming to hit this line at a, a certain time. Ten minutes later, you would aim for this line. So you keep aiming further and further away. So the barrage kept going in these intervals. And so the troops were supposed to advance just behind that creeping barrage. And you saw what a swamp you mess that is. Like, you got to keep up. And, you know, it, it's. Anyways, it got this detail. And this is. Um, a lot of the work that was done was, was done by, uh, I'm not sure you pronounce the name, Karar, Karar, you know, like that guy was leading the British uh, Canadian commander, World War I, Karar, is that how you pronounce it? Do you want to hurt? you wake up? <laughs> this is 101. Yeah, anyway, so the Canadians were really, uh, they really developed the science of, of all this. So, in the Great War of Hines, you can think of that, so just like from World War I. So if you ever get up there, you can see some maps. There's a big, you know, there's um, Passchendaele Ridge there, and this is pretty muddy. It's all the mud. Is Passchendaele still muddy like that? Now, this is what Passchendaele looks like now. Oh. Okay. Like, it's beautiful. It's like manicured. And you wouldn't know it. Like, this is what it looks like now. This is your top of Passchendaele Ridge. And you can see all these trees are kind of cut off the bottom. This is the ridge kind of big. Land drops down. So you really got it kind of like, I can't really see this, but this is it. This is where the Canadians came up this and took this area. I think it's beautiful. Uh, and then from that, you know, we drove around the sailing a little further, and this is it. This is ground zero. This is where the first gas attack happened in World War I. So this would have been occupied by, by French, Black, African, Colonial troops were here, no clue what was going to happen on this morning for this gas attack. So it came across these fields and wiped out, and they just, like, were, if you weren't like, killed in the first few minutes, they just ran to kill them. Um, it was pretty awful. So the Canadians had to come in and fill this spot right here, but this is exactly where it happened right here. And that's what it looked like. So um, they just opened up this thing, the wind was blowing the right direction, and this gas came pouring across. So there was no protecting against mm -hmm. gas attack. They no need to get the no gas pass and that's what you feel. You urinate in a in a in a handkerchief and put that over your face to neutralize it. But how well was that? So uh, not very nice experience. So you can see that this is where Langmark, this is where the attack happened, the gas was going this way. So the African troops, the French African mm -hmm. troops were all up here and they were just massacred. So it formed this bubble. So if you're facing that way, and you're, so you have this dirt running around on the left hand side, so they had to fill this gap right here. And there's all sorts of books about every sort of minute of the battle of what would happen, which I don't even have a clue about. Um, but still, a lot happened here. You can read about in World War One that um, um, we're kind of being shot down in a German called Polygon. So, a lot of these names are familiar to me, but only just in English. So that's the part they got, and they were stopped. Um, and that's what it looked like back then. Pretty nasty, nasty situation. 
Um, this windmill was actually blown up, but it was actually that was Angela Sakini for for that Canadian division that was operating that sector on that day. The building that we part of is there. Uh, and then and then there's you probably see this. <coughs> There's a picture of it. What's it called? It's called the, um, the Sondering Soldier or something. But this is where the Canadians landed uh, that first gas attack. So it's a famous attack. And then they turned into it. You know, it's not square. So we kind of drove around. This is a um, little, little town. This is uh, very close to the town where the French case, Dean Mayer. Uh, we took off from, and um, this monument is the biggest monument for a single individual aviator in the whole world. Like Charles Edward doesn't have a statue as big as this, and this is part of the So, um, and nearby, I didn't know it, but there's an airplane in one of these buildings here. Um, and then we went around this uh, area that's called the Kill 60, so they, they didn't have made the hill, which was a long, so they numbered them, so those are 60. And they actually mined underneath them, blew the, blew the top off. So it looks nice today, but these are actually mom figures that have just grown over. So just another, you know, this by the end of the day, we're getting pretty, pretty buzz by the end of the day. But it's, it's all these, this used to be a big deal. But it's on the wall and the other ground. These are all shovels. So it's a little easier to imagine than you now. The front line was exactly at this spot right here. Anyways. Memorials everywhere. Um, my wife's Indian, and this is where the first Indian division attacked, uh, had their first battle, right on this one right here. So it's kind of neat. We came there, and all the Indian, Gurdu, and uh, anyways, so she goes, you know, sort of meant something to her. Um, and it's just an aerial view. When we went back to the town, went into the block hall, so you can see them. that's our hotel on the bottom right hand side. Um, and then we went through um, at night at 8 o'clock since 1920 something. There's a ceremony at, at dusk at, at the Men and Gate, which was actually that's the Men and Gate right there. So that, that was what it looked like um, before World War I. So it's all been rebuilt. So every single night at 8 o'clock, um, there's a ceremony where they do uh, uh, black post. So we had about, about two or three thousand people crowded into this plaza, in this area, in front of the Men and Gate. And there were kids, you know, school groups, and they're on their cell phones and chattering away, and just a din of noise. I thought it was crazy. Um, 8 o'clock, right on the button, it went dead quiet. You were going to come? Dead quiet. You could drop, you could hear ping pong, everybody. And then out came reviewers, and they did the last post, and they read in Finders Field, but then we had every single night since 1921. So it was really a uh, somber, like a, quite a moving experience. So men and gate, he had some symbols on. These are all names of people who died there, there. Well, they're just um, motivation. But it's a new town. You take care of the bus there, walk around, and they rebuilt the cloth hall. And um, there's all sorts of restaurants, free food, and there's restaurants for the holiday. So, were you there tonight? Were you in Brussels? What's that? You're in Brussels? Yeah. Did you get to eat? Um, no, I went to Flanders. Oh, okay. You know. Anyway, that's inside the platform. How long of a drive from Paris to here? From Paris to there? Well, I think, well, we were, um, we rented an hour in Paris a couple times ago. You put this out. Six hours? I think we took a little trial because it's a little Turn left. So turn left. Why don't you turn left? It's totally turn left. It's not turn right. I think my, my daughter was in Paris when we were there. Okay. And I think she's, I think it's maybe eight hours. But turn left. Okay. Yeah, okay. 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 It was a basket case and he drove like nuts. Okay. Well, we flew to in Brussels and we, we drove about two hours and back to. To eat. So, okay, just that you've got five minutes. Is that? Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Three hours twenty. Three hours twenty. Three hours twenty. Just got right now. All right, there's a little right cool 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 shop right in here that I bought this up. But anyways, um, there you go. That's the end of that. Um, it's about repeating the backcourt street of our military people who fought and died for us, and a lot of cool stuff to study. So, at the end.